It's uh, going through the motions here. Okay, Bruce, we're live. You're we're all set. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Bruce. I'm a mentor with uh, FRC Team 2852, which is the Dennis Morris High Voltage Team located in St. Catharines. And today, our workshop is going to be mechanical devices. And we're going to talk about bearings and other anti-friction devices. And bearings help our world to keep moving. So what is friction? Friction is a type of force. It's defined as the resistance to motion of one object moving relative to another. And if you've ever pushed a box along a floor, you will have encountered the friction forces. You must exert force against the box to overcome the friction force before the box will move. So the cause of friction is the interlocking of irregularities or also called asperities on the surface of the two materials. If you take a look at a microscopic look of the two surfaces of this box on this piece of concrete, you'll see that both surfaces have peaks and valleys of surface roughness. These peaks tend to interlock into the valleys and that's what gives you friction. And as you overcome that friction, these peaks and valleys tend to scrape across each other. And that's why when you push that box across that concrete, you get a little bit of the box left on the concrete, and you get a little bit of the concrete left on the box. So there are three types of friction. Static friction, where there's no motion. Kinetic, also called dynamic or sliding friction, when the box or the material starts to move. And then rolling friction, which is a roller rolling along the surface. Now the energy used to overcome friction results in surface wear and heat. We need to minimize wear and heat to prevent a robot failure. So anti-friction devices will have specific properties that minimize friction. And they can include a material, either metal, plastic, either a flat sheet of plastic or rollers, and ceramics, lubricant, oil, grease, water, and mud. They use a mud slurry when they're drilling oil wells or a, um, even a water well. Coatings, Teflon, graphite, which is the same material that's in your pencil, molybdenum is one of the elements used or mechanical devices bearings we're going to talk a lot about bearings because they're very important so a bearing is a term that defines a device or material that reduces friction the main types of mechanical bearings, you have a plane bearing, which is a round shaft rotating in a cylindrical hole. A rolling element bearing, such as a ball or a roller, is placed between two races. And we're going to talk about what races are in a little bit. A fluid bearing uses pressurized fluid to separate the moving element. Magnetic bearings uses magnetic fields to separate the moving elements. And then even jewel bearings used in watchmaking and precision rotating devices. Developed by the watchmakers in Switzerland many hundreds of years ago. So let's start with plane bearings. A plane bearing can be as simple as a shaft in a drilled hole. You probably all used one of these when you walked into the room today. A standard hinge. Here's another hinge with a pin and the drilled holes. This one's a little heavier duty than the other one. 
the shaft has a large contact zone with the hole. So you can see between the arrows, that's roughly where the shaft will contact the hinge or contact the hole. And if you've ever had a squeaky door, you know that lubrication is important to this type of bearing. Here's a plain bearing that has a steel ring, and then it has a bronze material composite on the inside. Bronze is a very special material. So a plain or bushing bearing has many shapes and can be made with a variety of materials. So if we're talking bushing bearings, we can have a bronze sleeve bushing, a flanged steel bushing, or a flanged nylon bushing. Or here we have a 3D printed linear bearing. In this case, the green bearing would be held uh, stationary and the rod would slide axially through the bearing and it would support the rod. So let's talk about plain bearing materials. Sintered bronze. I put dollar signs to explain a relative cost of the materials, perhaps. Bronze is an alloy or a mixture of two elements, in this case, copper and tin. Bronze powder metal is sintered in a furnace. So the powder, which is pebbled metal, really, is pressed into a form and then it's heated in a furnace. Now, when it's heated, the powder metal becomes solid, but it has a sponge-like structure. And if you take a look at the microscopic inset of this picture, you can see the individual pellets of the bronze, and you can see the gaps between those little pellets. Now, that's important because this material can be impregnated with lubricating oil, making them self-lubricating. The structure is almost sponge-like. It will take considerable loads, but they tend to be a little bit expensive compared to a plastic bushing. Some other metals, steel, a little more expensive. Here's a steel bushing with some lubrication grooves ground into it. There's a multitude of grades of alloying uh, steels that are possible. Um, a huge number of different grades and types of steel that they can use. They need lubrication to prevent catastrophic wear. Tungsten is a unique material and it tends to be on the expensive side, but it's extremely hard and very wear resistant. It's used where long life is required. They're expensive. And they're sort of hard to machine. Babbitt alloy was developed back in the 1800s. And it's a, an alloy of tin, lead, and copper. And they still use a thin layer of this in automobile engine bearings on crankshafts. So plastic less expensive, many materials. There's all sorts of plastics out there. Some common ones though are nylon, HDPE or high density polyethylene. PLA, polyactide is used in 3D printing machines. PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene, or if you're from DuPont, you get to call it Teflon. That's their brand of PTFE. And another common one is acetyl. Acetyl tends to be a fairly hard plastic. Now, one thing about plastic is most of them are thermoplastic, and that term means that they melt when they are heated. Melting temperatures vary widely. Nylon has a relatively high melting point, but it's a little more expensive. So plastic is not suitable for high speed and high load applications because those type of applications tend to cause heat. And obviously heat does not go well with plastic. 
ceramics tend to be a little more expensive, high hardness, and they give good wear properties. They are more expensive, but they do not corrode in wet environments. There is no iron or steel in these bushings. They're not recommended where shock loads occur because just like fine china, if you shock it, it will break. So let's move on to roller bearings, the second type of bearing. Roller bearings are the most commonly used type of bearings. These bearings have some of the lowest rolling resistance and the highest load capacity. They also come in a multitude of configurations. Here is a ball or a spherical roller bearing. It's exploded, but you can see we have an inner race and an outer race. The race has a conical groove machined into it and it will fit the roller bearing in that groove. The outer race has a matching uh, groove on the inside. Then we have the balls, the spherical rollers, and we have a cage which separates the balls so that they don't rub against each other. Then on either end, we have a seal. Very important because dirt and liquid uh, such as water uh, are the, one of the main causes of bearing failures. So let's see what it looks like when it's all together. Here we have once again, the outer race with the ball in the groove, the inner race with the ball in the groove, the rolling elements, and then a cage. In this case, it's not plastic, it's actually metal and it's riveted together. And then of course, the two seals on either side. The rolling elements can be spherical. They can be rollers, either a cylindrical roller or a tapered roller, and even needle shaped. So here's a spherical roller. And now you can see the motion of this in this GIF. So we have a shaft that's rotating. We have an inner race that's pressed on that's rotating with the shaft. And then the balls are rotating at they move against the stationary outer race. And remember the cage we talked about? If you take a look, when the ball is rotating, it's rotating up on one side and down on the other side. And if these balls were contacting each other, they would be turning in opposite directions when they, when they touched, and that would lead to a lot of wear. Here's a cylindrical roller bearing. You can see that we have a cylinder type roller. We have a different type of groove on the inner and outer race. Here's a tapered roller bearing. You can see that the diameter at one end is larger and smaller on the other. And we get what we call an angular contact on these types of bearings. Very important for load considerations. And here's a classic needle bearing. And needle bearings are still used very extensively in automotive transmissions, where you have high speeds and relatively high loads. So let's talk a little bit about roller bearing loading considerations. The type of roller bearing chosen will depend on the application and the expected forces. Bearing forces are broken down into radial load and axial or thrust load. A spherical bearing will take heavy radial forces, but only light axial forces. So here's a roller bearing, a spherical roller bearing. And you can see that the radial force, it would be the weight of whatever you are supporting. It goes directly through the axis of the shaft. A thrust or axial force is one that would be pushing sideways on this bearing. And as it pushes sideways on the bearing, it will try and shift this inner race towards the right. And it will shift the contact zone in the bearing itself. A tapered roller bearing will take heavy forces in both directions. 
And you can see here that with the angular contact and a tapered roller bearing, you can get forces acting both axially and radially and will not cause any problems. So what causes the axial or thrust forces in a wheel bearing? Let's talk about a car. There's centrifugal forces created by driving around a corner, and these must be counteracted through the tires on the road. So as you drive around that corner, if you're driving quickly in a tight corner, you'll notice that you start to get pushed to the outside of the arc of the circle. And that's called a centrifugal force. Newton's third law says that every force must be counteracted with an equal and opposite force. In this case, we call it centripetal force. And it basically reacts through the four tires on your car. So that centripetal force must be transferred from the tire to the wheel through the wheel bearings into the car to take that mass around the corner. These forces, as I say, have to be transferred through the wheel spindle. So once again, that axial force has to go sideways through these bearings. So what would that look like? Here's a very typical tapered roller bearing design that is used on most automotive and trailer wheels. So you have a spindle, you see it has two different diameters and then it has a thread on the end. And here's what would go on that spindle. We have an automotive hub, which you can recognize the uh, studs that you put your wheel on. There's your lug nuts to keep the wheel on the hub. Inside that hub is a bore where we press the race, the outer race of both of the uh, bearings into it. And then here we have the other half of the outer bearing, which is the inner race and then the rolling elements. We do the same here, that all gets put into the axle. And then that nut and the washer squeezes it all together. And that's how we keep all those heavy shock loads of an automobile going through that hub safely. And of course, on either end, we have a dust cap and a double lip seal. And those are to keep all that nasty dust and sand and salt and water out of that hub. So the last type of roller bearing we should talk about very commonly used is a pillow block. And it will support a rotating shaft load. So here's a classic pillow block assembly. It has a steel shaft and then two pillow blocks. Inside that pillow block is um, roller bearings. Now an example of this would be a shaft between perhaps an electric motor and a large industrial blower fan. So you might have a motor attached to a pulley on the one end and on the other end you would have it attached to the industrial blower. So if you break this open and take a look inside you can see you have an inner race with a groove an outer race, which is actually the casting of the pillow block, and then the rolling elements and the cage. Now, because we have roller bearings and we have a conical surface here, we can get a little bit of misalignment out of these and they will happily work that way. Now, this example is right at the limit of its out of, out of uh, alignment condition. And you can see that the ball is starting to get pinched between these two surfaces. But if you were to straighten this a little bit, you would move the contact back into this area, and these would quite happily run that way. Pillow blocks come in a wide assortment and um, weights from very light duty ones to heavy duty bearings. Pillow blocks. So let's take a look at a tapered bearing application. Here's a heavy duty application in a wind turbine. So if you were to take the back nacelle off that wind turbine, 
you might see something like this. We've got the hub and the three blades. And can you see the pillow blocks? They're in blue right here. Very large pillow blocks. And this is what they would look like inside perhaps. Here we have double tapered roller bearings. And these may be uh, up to two to two and a half feet in diameter, extremely large bearings. So rolling bearing materials, with few exceptions, they're generally made of high alloy steel. The alloying elements added to the steel are usually small amounts of chromium, nickel, and molybdenum. These are the most common. However, steel has, oh, probably 15, 20 different elements in it, all very carefully controlled to make the proper steel. Steel is a little bit like making hocus pocus magic. Uh, it's uh, a chemistry experiment that they are constantly checking to make sure that their steel is right before they cast it. After the bearings are made, they're heat treated in a furnace to increase the hardness of the steel, and that reduces the wear and the friction. So here you see some inner bearing races going into a furnace. They'll heat this up to a certain temperature, and then they will quench these very quickly, either in oil or some other fluid, to harden the material. It will change the microstructure of the steel so that it increases the hardness of the steel, and that gives you great wear. So bearings can also be made out of ceramic and plastic materials. Not as common, but there are out there. Here's a ceramic bearing. And the nice thing is they will not corrode or rust and they resist most chemicals that perhaps might attack steel. Ceramic bearings are expensive and plastic bearings unfortunately have a low load carrying capacity. Hence, they're not used too often. So let's talk a little bit about the roller contact zone profiles and lubrication. So what is it about rotating bearings that make them so efficient at reducing friction? And the answer is high material hardness and small rolling contact zones, shortened as CZ, and good lubrication. So high hardness, small contact zones, and good lubrication. Both these things and will lead to low rolling resistance with minimum sliding friction. Actually, all three of these things. So if we take a look at the contact zones of a ball and a roller, a ball sitting on a metal surface with no load has almost a pinpoint contact zone, extremely small. As you load and squeeze the ball, it will elastically deform and the contact zone in a bearing will start to spread. And it will spread to do two things. First of all, it will give a larger area to transfer that load through. And it will also help the lubrication to squeeze into that surface, into that contact zone. A roller bearing has a almost a line contact. And as it gets loaded up, it will turn into an elongated oval. So small contact zones until you get the loads on them. Lubrication can be broken down into three categories. Boundary, mixed, and full film lubrication. Remember we talked about the asperities. If those asperities, if the high points are touching, it's called boundary lubrication. It means that we have metal on metal contacting each other. Mixed lubrication would be a mixture of boundary and full film. And that usually happens when we have something that starts and stops, such as a pump, or a fan that would be turned on and off. And when it's stationary, it's 
contacting the points, and that's boundary lubrication. But when it starts to turn, it squeezes the oil or the lubrication in between the surfaces to help separate them. Now, full film lubrication, which is the one that we would like to have, completely separates the two materials with a film of oil. So fill, full film offers the lowest friction, the highest efficiency, the lowest amount of wear, and because of all of this, the longest life. Full film lubrication completely separates the two surfaces. Now a fluid bearing, we can reduce bearing friction and wear by introducing and maintaining this film of lubrication between the two surfaces. And the best way to do that, as you can see, here's the contact. We don't want these points touching each other. The film can be a liquid like water, oil, or grease, or a gas like air or nitrogen. The film can be a coating, a bath, or a pressurized fluid. Now, if you develop a full film between, we call that hydrodynamic lubrication. And if designed properly, the bearing will have very good wear and friction uh, characteristics. So in this case, we have a bath of oil. And as the shaft rotates, it tends to develop a wedge that squeezes the oil into the contact zone. When the oil gets squeezed, the pressure goes up dramatically. You can see the pressure wedge that develops. And that pressure wedge will actually lift that shaft away from the stationary race. Another way to do that is with pressurized fluid. Here is a GIF showing a shaft rotating and then introducing the pressurized fluid. And what happens is the fluid actually equalizes the pressure all the way around the shaft and lifts the shaft away from the stationary race. And at that point, it becomes hydrodynamic and you have zero contact between the two surfaces. Hydrodynamic lubrication is one of the things that you always try and achieve. So let's talk about magnetic bearings. These are high end. In this bearing, active magnetic coils create a magnetic field that repels the shaft into a non-contact position. And it would look something like this. You can see the wires coming in to electrify the individual electromagnets. And these magnets would push away or repulse the shaft in an equal position so that when the non-contact position, the friction is negligible. So it actually moves away so that it's quite literally spinning in air. The bearings are very expensive and they're not always practical for most applications. One of the reasons is the amount of energy used to actually separate the shaft from these pads takes a fair amount of electric, electrical energy. So some applications would include military and spacecraft. Think stuff from NASA. These were used in the space shuttle concept. Another type of magnetic bearing, maybe, is a linear magnetic bearing concept. And these are used in the bullet trains that you uh, see in some other countries where they are actually levitating the carriages uh, between magnets. So once again, they have, if you look at the enlargement, they have an active magnet, which they vary so that they keep that space uh, equalized. And they can do this at exceptionally high speeds, um, two, 300 kilometers an hour, some of these trains will travel. And the final one we talked about was a jewel bearing. And these are 
used in classic high-priced mechanical watches. Long ago, uh, this is how watches were made. Now with the advent of electronics and batteries, they don't do, uh, have these too often, but they are still being made and they're still out there. So I'm gonna share a, uh, a neat little, let's see. Okay, that one, no, uh, let's see here. So, can you guys see that? So here we have a watch mechanism and you can see the mainspring, which powers the watch, gets wound by the uh, crown. You have the regulating wheel, which moves the ratchet mechanism here. And you see these red elements here. These are actually either a synthetic or a real ruby or sapphire. You can see they're on both sides. And these are actually miniature bearings. So these wheels are actually rotating inside of these bearings. A neat little animation showing how a watch works, a mechanical watch. So with that, that is the end of our presentation. I thank you for your attention and I wish you good luck in building your robots. And with that, Wayne, I will turn it back over to you.